Hey guys, this is part two of my little demo for my DIY garden automation system. Part one was focusing on the hardware, but in this one I want to look at the user interface for the most part. And I also have to address something which I said I would and then didn't in the last video, which was my nutrient stirring system. One of the things that I had to figure out with this system was how I was going to keep all these nutrients mixed in these jars because if they're just sitting there sort of stagnant in like a semi unattended system then you're not going to get a very good mixture of these things when you go to dose out of them. You know it might be really concentrated at the bottom or whatever and it'd be a pain in the ass to have to take these jars off and shake them or stir them manually. So the thing I came up with was these magnetic stirring shelves and the idea of using a like a computer fan with magnets on it is not mine. I found it elsewhere on the internet and sort of adapted it, but I think the way I've done it is better than a lot of the ones that I've seen. So let me show you how I did it. So for structural support, I've got just a couple of 2x4s that are bolted to the backboard. And then I screwed down these PC fans on top of the 2x4s. These are just like a 12 volt DC fan. And on each fan, I have super glued a stack of these rare earth magnets. I've got I've got four per stack and they're on opposite sides of each one of the fans at about an inch apart or so. And you have to make sure that you flip one side so that the, the polarity doesn't match between the magnets. So they're all super glued on there and the glue holds really well even if there's a sticker on top of the fan I found like having to get one of these columns off I, I think I took like a chunk of a magnet off when I tried the first time, so surprising how well super glue actually holds. So then I've got standoffs on top of the fans that bring this quarter inch hardboard a little bit off the surface so it doesn't rub on the fan at all. And I've cut a hole at each jar location to allow these magnets to kind of poke through and they're pretty much flush with the top of this hardboard surface. So you try to find a standoff that will get you to that point because you want the magnets to be as close as possible to the bottom of your jars. And then in every one of the jars I've got one of these magnetic stirrers. This is like a 30 millimeter version I believe. Ideally it'll be pretty much the same width as your two stacks are uh, the distance between them on the fan itself. So you can see when I put this thing on it grabs it right away in place even if I turn this jar it's pretty much locked on just through magnetism. So let me fire this up. One last cute feature that I want to share before I get into the UI is voice control. Check this out. Hey Siri, turn off the green screen lights. Hey Siri, turn on Relay 2 and Relay 5. Okay. Hey Siri, turn on Outlet 0. Okay. Hey Siri, turn off Outlet 0. Done. Hey Siri, turn on the pH down pump. Done. Turn off the pH down pump. What is the temperature in the pepper tent? The temperature in your indoor garden home is 16 degrees Celsius. All right, onto the user interface. So these five tabs at the top, home calibration control schedule and stats are tabs that I've created and each one of them has its own layout of cards. So every one of these little boxes is a card. And in Home Assistant, you, you can pick what you want your card to look like, whether it's a graph or a list or a gauge, and then you pick what entity or what data do you actually want to display on it. So on my Home tab here, I've grouped together pretty much all the readouts from the sensors that I want to see. So for example, I'm looking at the tent temperature, humidity, I'm reading out the reservoir water level, I have the status of a motion detector that I use to turn a light on and off down here so I don't have to fumble around or look for my phone to turn the light on. The uh, temperature of the water in the res, the temperature of the control box, my EC, pH, the status of the basin in the tent, so when that float sensor triggers then this will change and let me know. 
the flood detection system. So when any of those probes detect water, it'll tell me which one it was. Same deal with the notification that goes to my phone, just so I can, I can start looking at that area right away. And uh, I'm also looking at the tent temperature and humidity that I get up here in like a graph form so I can just see the general trend a lot easier. And if you click on it, then you get a, a more detailed readout with some actual data. Okay, onto the control tab. The control section is where I've grouped together all the switches and relays and, and uh, inputs for controlling the system. So for example, these are my Wi-Fi switches. If I turn my green screen lights on, you'll see that light up behind me. The power bar, those four outlets on the bottom, I have manual control of these as well. Turn these all on and off. And most of these things are controlled through scripts or automations that I've programmed elsewhere, but I wanted to have manual control of just about everything too. So even that eight channel relay board that sits inside the control box, you can hear that turning on as I toggle these. can control the pumps from here and then I have a few more things that are a little bit more complex than just simple on and off so these are automations at the bottom I had just sort of added them to this page for some troubleshooting so turning these on and off is not actually turning the fan on and off it's just turning the automation that controls the fan on and off the pH and newt dosing and the climate targets are inputs that I've created and these inputs allow me to communicate with the system and tell it how I want it to function so for the temperature and humidity I've given myself these little sliders that let me pick the targets for each one of these properties so let's say I wanted 40 percent humidity in the tent I would set it to here and I've given the system like an acceptable range for humidity it's within 10 percent on either side so if I set it to 40 as long as it's actually reading less than 50 and more than 30 then it's going to be happy and nothing is going to happen so the the system is constantly going to be reading this sensor this one in particular is tied to that automation it's going to be reading this number and comparing it against the target that I've set right now it's at 40.6 and the target is 40 so it's like right on the money nothing's going to happen but if I come back to here right now the humidifier is off if I crank this thing to say 80 percent humidity then the next time this sensor reads which hopefully is soon I think it, it's like a 30 second interval the next time it reads it it's gonna come in at 40 percent and say oh man like I'm 40 percent off target so it's gonna turn the humidifier on and it's going to lower the speed of the exhaust fan to try and get that humidity back up to where it needs to be there, it just turned on, just when I finished my sentence. Beautiful. This slider at the top is target pH, which works very similarly to, to the humidity and the temperature, where whatever I set here is just going to, to tell the system where it needs to be. So right now it's set to 6.0, and I've given this one a tolerance of 0.1 on either side. So at 6.0, as long as it's less than 6.1 and more than 5.9, nothing's going to happen. But if it gets lower than that, it's going to trigger my pH up. And if it gets higher than that, it's going to trigger my pH down pumps. And these pumps come on for just a fraction of a second, spit out a tiny little bit of solution, and then wait 30 seconds or so. Read it again. Is it within range? Yes or no? You know, leave it or act on it. And I've watered these things down too because I found full strength was it was hard to make small adjustments so that's probably all, maybe like 50 percent water 50 percent ph down in there to just give me a little bit more leeway when i when i dump some adjustments into the system this target ec slider and then all the individual nutrient sliders plus the batch size and this dose nutrients button are all linked together to do one thing which is to dose an entirely new fresh batch of nutrients I'm just flooding my plants and it all ends up returning back to the reservoir so I have to do res changes every week or w depends how on the ball I am but in order to do the res change I have like a sequence that I follow so once it's empty completely empty then I start by picking how big of a batch size I want to make the last one was 12 gallons and then I pick my different uh, ratios and these are in milliliters per gallon which is such a weird ratio but I found it the easiest to work with and I'm just setting it full strength to whatever the bottle tells me 
So let's say I was to set these all for five milliliters per gallon as per the instructions. And I know that's what not what most people do. Usually you cut it in half or whatever, but I have a system for this. So full strength. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll pick what I want my actual target EC to be. That way, like by setting it full strength, I know that I've got my ratios right. And then I'll tell it, let's say I want it to actually be 1.2 EC. So that's all selected. Then I'll hold this button. It's not a tap, it's a hold just to make sure I don't do this by accident. I'll hold it and then the system will do a bunch of math. It'll say, okay, what is your batch size? It's 12. How much CalMeg are you doing per gallon? Five, well, I'll give you 60 mils. And it'll do that for everything. And it'll start a sequence. So f the first thing it does is it'll fill my mixing res until it detects that there's 12 gallons of water in there. And then it'll dose whatever the math works out to be for the CalMeg, 60 milliliters. It'll stir it around and wait for a minute or two minutes. I can't remember what I set the delay to be. But then it'll move on to the next thing and the next thing and the ne next thing with a delay in between every one of them. So when that's done, my EC is probably going to be pretty high dosing at full strength. So it'll, it'll read that. Let's say it ended up at like 2.0 or something. Then it looks at what my target EC is set to and it starts dumping in more RO water, just pure water, until it dilutes down and hits this target within whatever range I've set, which is actually pretty tight on the EC. So even though I set this to 12 gallons, it might add another three gallons or whatever before it actually hits my target, depending on what it comes out to after dosing at full strength. And I have a few fail safes in place just to make sure that it doesn't overfill that reservoir. So I have the float valve coming into it, which should stop it physically. I also have the program telling it if it hits a certain volume, which is something like 18 and a half or 19 gallons, then stop. And I also have a drain, like an overflow physical drain that comes out of this thing just to make sure that there's no way that this thing can overflow on me. Onto the calibration tab. So this is where I calibrate the pH probe, the EC probe, and the peristaltic pump speed. The EC probe pretty much never really needs to be recalibrated. It's almost like a set it and forget it, but I'm probably going to check on it every couple of months or so, and if I need to recalibrate it, then it, it'll be easy to do from here. The pH probe gets calibrated a lot more often, and in order to calibrate these Atlas Scientific probes, you have to send a certain string or like a certain sentence to the stamps that are sitting on this board here. So you have to talk to these things in a certain way. And what I've done is just tie strings to these buttons. So when I hit this pH cal step one, it's going to fire off something that says, uh, it'll say mid comma cal comma seven for this one. This would be low cal four, high cal 10. And then uh, when I hit that third step, the program will then ask the sensor how many points it has calibrated in it and if it replies it's got three points calibrated then I just send a message back saying that calibration is complete and we're good to go. I added this card here with the last 10 pH readings and this just continuously updates itself as uh, it, more readings stream in just to allow me to see at a glance like whether or not the probe has settled. The sensor is like getting consistent readings after I stick it into a, like a new solution, like a, a 7 or a 4 or a 10 or whatever, because if it's really jumpy, then I don't want to move on to the next step. In order to calibrate my peristaltic pumps, what I do is I just enter a value here in milliliters. So let's say I want to calibrate for 5 milliliters, then I'll turn on what it, whichever switch I want to calibrate to whichever pump. So let's say I wanted to do the pH pump, I would hit this, and then it should give me five milliliters of solution and then turn itself off. So what I do is I'll just measure what it gives me. If it's out, let's say it gives me five and a half or six milliliters, then I would turn the speed down to 209 or 208 or whatever and repeat this process for all these pumps until they're all giving me consistent results. Okay, the schedule tab. So on the schedule tab, I'm keeping track of the current date and time. Uh, this is an input box to specify when my grow started 
and the system will then do some calculations and tell me how many days it's been since then and what week of the grow I'm on because I'm terrible at keeping track of that information and it also tells me the last time that I mixed a fresh batch of nutrients. It's got the lighting schedule which is very self-explanatory then fertigations this section in the middle is all about how many times and for how long I'm watering every day so right now I'm set to water five times or fertigate five times per day and when I change this it also changes the amount of cards that show up to allow me to pick the time for each one of these events so when I've got five of them up then I pick five times that I want these things to these events to occur and then I choose how long in minutes I want each fertigation to be, how long that pump should be on for. The last tab is stats and I honestly I just had this up to do some troubleshooting a long time ago on the Raspberry Pi and uh, it doesn't really do me much good now. It tells you how much memory is free and what the disk use percentage is but uh, I never visit this tab, I just haven't really gotten rid of it. When I access my user interface from my desktop PC, which you do just by pointing it at the IP address of the Home Assistant server, you get a lot more space for the cards, so you can arrange them nicely, and you also get things like units of measurement that pop up on the cards, whereas on my tablet I don't have those because there, there's no space, so I have to actually move the sliders to see where they're set, but on the PC that's not an issue. And you can, you can put in a lot of work to make your interface look really pretty on, on your desktop or even on the tablet. Mine is very basic, but there are some people out there who have some really, really nice setups and, and graphing and visual elements that I don't have. This is what the app looks like on my phone. Everything is squished into one single column, so it's not the easiest to navigate, but it's great to have when you're not at home. So if I'm out and about, it's, it's still pretty easy just to quickly zip around the different tabs and, and move up and down to get whatever I need out of it. So that should about do it for this video. There's a lot more going on in the background in uh, Home Assistant. I'm just looking at my overview tab with the stuff that I've created, but there's also things like a, a logbook, which will give you a, a record of everything that's happened. You can look at history, which will give you uh, readouts for all the states of your entities and even graph them for you. Uh, there's, there's a lot of functionality and, and a whole lot to go over that would take a much longer time than I, than I want this video to last for, but Maybe it'll be subject for another video in the future just to have a look at what's going on sort of under the hood with Home Assistant or maybe uh, take one of my spare pies and do like a fresh install on it just to show you guys what's uh, involved in setting this thing up or something like that. But until then, take care. See you next time.